So um, in this first talk, what I wanted to do uh, was talk about precision oncology. And as I thought about 20 minutes on precision oncology, you can't get very far. But what I'd really like to look at is precision oncology through the framework of breast cancer, and specifically hormone receptor positive breast cancer. So what is precision oncology? It's personalized uh, cancer care and using molecular profiling. And the idea here is we tailor the treatment to the individual biologic characteristics of each patient's cancer. And if we can do that successfully, then we'll get them the best treatment. As you heard, some of the great advances in hematologic malignancies using this approach. Same thing in breast cancer, same thing in every cancer, and trying uh, at the same time to reduce the toxicity. So you've all heard the right patient, right drug at right time. In order to do this, you have to understand the biology of the disease. And that means not just individual genes, but individual genes in their context, and i.e. in their particular uh, disease state. And you also have to have the right diagnostic tests. So this is a uh, figure that was published by Levy Garraway about 10 years ago in JCO as the future treatment flow for precision oncology. And I think Dr. Garraway was very prescient because it is the current treatment flow for precision oncology. We see a patient, we get a biopsy, we do molecular testing on it, we have a molecular tumor board, we make a decision on how to treat a patient, um, and then Unfortunately, most targeted therapies work for a while. Cancer cells are smart and they uh, become resistant. We get another biopsy and the way we're doing that is changing. We'll go over that a little bit. And then we make another treatment decision. This is the way we're treating cancer today. So you might be surprised to know that the first targeted therapy in cancer dates back two centuries ago. And this is uh, arguably the first use of targeted therapy, which was surgical in nature, not a medication. This was uh, Dr. Beetson, a Scottish physician who had an interest in uh, how uh, menstrual cycles impacted um, wi women and disease and also looked in animals and found uh, that the mammary glands of animals changed with uh, different times of menses or uh, with the ovaries and so did cancers. So he did an experiment where he treated three women with oophorectomy in 1896 with metastatic breast cancer. Two out of those three women responded. That was, he didn't know why, he had a clue of what was going on. This was the first use of targeted therapy, in this case, removing the ovaries and removing the source of estrogen. The first medical use of biologically rational designed targeted therapy was in 1971 a new anti-estrogen agent in late breast cancer, an early clinical appraisal of ICI-46474. You might know uh, that number as a drug which has now been used to cure more cancer patients than any other drug in history. It's called tamoxifen. So why did it work? It worked because we understood what the target was and we understood that what the targeted therapy was. The target was estrogen receptor. This was discovered in 1958 by a chemist, uh, and it was a member of the what we now know as a superfamily of nuclear hormone receptors um, that are ligand activated and they cause transcription. And there are many other examples of uh, these ligands which go in, in a variety of different organs and diseases. The targeted therapy, tamoxifen, was first uh, designed as a contraceptive. It was not an effective contraceptive. But uh, Craig Jordan picked this up as a postdoc and looked at it and understood it to be a partial agonist antagonist of the estrogen receptor. And uh, working uh, with uh, the uh, person who found the estrogen receptor, they designed the trials, which you just saw. And today, of course, uh, tamoxifen can be used in both pre- and postmenopausal women, early in metastatic breast cancer, and has saved a lot of lives. So now we understand the estrogen signaling pathway much better uh, than we did uh, years and years ago. And we understand biology of cancer much better. We understand that estrogen in breast cancer and uh, certain other diseases is a ligand for the estrogen receptor. In normal breast tissue, of course, it causes development of the mammary glands. The estrogen receptor binds to uh, estrogen and then translocates to the nucleus where it interacts with a number of estrogen response elements to either turn on transcription or turn it off. 
But what's also interesting about the estrogen receptor is that it interacts with uh, the most of the tyrosine kinase uh, receptors that are on the surface and include the EGFR pathway and HER2 pathway and the IGFR pathway and others. So all of which signal downstream through uh, the various pathways of PI3 kinase, MAP kinase, and so forth. So think that there's this incredible interaction between at the estrogen receptor, which is the dominant driver of growth in both normal cells and in a large uh, proportion of, um, of uh, cancerous breast cancer, and they also interact with all the other major pathways. So because tamoxifen was developed, that led to the development of a large number of uh, agents for hormone receptor positive metastatic breast cancer, including what are now called other SERMs, SERMs meaning selective estrogen receptor modulators, have both agonist and antagonist properties. Uh, in the old days, uh, Kurt and I are, are old enough to remember when uh, our mentors actually used estrogen to treat breast cancer. It does work uh, in certain uh, settings. We also have down regulators, the so-called SIRDs, which talk about the aromatase inhibitors, which work not at the receptor level, but simply by depleting estrogen, the ligand, uh, and then progestins. So 20 years ago, we did the trials um, that looked at the aromatase inhibitors versus tamoxifen and metastatic breast cancer, and they were better. And uh, after doing multiple trials, it turned out that the progression-free survival in metastatic breast cancer first line for an AI was around 10 months. So 20 years ago, that meant a lot to us. We've come a long way uh, since then, but that was good. And so that became the standard of care. Also about 20 years ago, the SIRDs came into uh, clinical trial and then, um, and then approval. And the SIRDs work a little differently. Uh, they block estrogen receptor activity, and they also reduce the estrogen receptor uh, protein level. So you can call them a down regulator or a degrader. They actually have multiple effects. The first one that was approved was fulvestrin in 2002. Um, we're 20 years later. We still don't have another SIRD approved yet, but we do have fulvestrin in combination, and we also uh, just in the last year have seen the first data, you'll probably hear from Dr. Vidal later, about um, the oral SIRDs, which are coming. There's at least 10 in development, and I do believe this will be uh, a new uh, advance in uh, personalized and targeted therapy for HR-positive breast cancer. This is the data that compared head-to-head -head for Vestrin versus anastrozole in first-line setting. Uh, it was better, as you can see, uh, a modest improvement, but nonetheless an improvement. So why don't these drugs work forever? Um, we block the main pathway, as I told you, the estrogen receptor pathway by one means or another. A as I alluded to, the reason they don't work is because breast cancer cells can upregulate compensatory pathways. When you block one, it's like a dam. You block part of the dam, and then the river flows over a different way, so through uh, many other different pathways. And one of the, uh, um, the pathways that are most important is the cell cycling pathway. And estrogen receptor itself stimulates the cell cycling pathway. So when, it is, uh, when you lose resistance to that, or when you get resistance to that, then, then the cell cycle pathway comes up, and it can also be stimulated through those other pathways. So blocking the cell cycle became an important target. And as you know, uh, over the last decade, the most important advance in HR-positive um, breast cancer has been the development of the class of agents that are called the CDK4-6 inhibitors. CDK4-6 is part of a complex mechanism that regulates a checkpoint in G1 that allows the cell to divide and, and grow. So uh, I won't go into the details there, but uh, C CDK4-6 inhibition stops cell cycle progression, and that prevents proliferation. Um, we know from these first-line trials, looking at three different drugs that are CDK4-6 inhibitors, that they all work very well, um, and that includes pavlocyclib, ribocyclib, and abemocyclib. And you can see uh, the curves here with about a 40 to 50% improvement in progression-free survival in the first-line setting when you add a CDK4-6 inhibitor to, to uh, anti-estrogen therapy or endocrine therapy. So you must block both pathways at the same time to get maximally effective. And that makes sense. 
you know, we have designed most of our trials and most of our thinking around blocking one gene, one node on the pathway, but we, we've now come to understand that while that might work for a while, we need a different approach that blocks multiple uh, genes at the same time or multiple parts in the pathway because of these compensatory mechanisms that occur, both upstream or downstream or across pathways. So the other uh, pathway that was uh, important uh, is the PI3 kinase uh, pathway through mTOR. And this is uh, uh, signaled through the growth factor receptors like EGFR, HER2, uh, uh, and so forth. Uh, PI3 kinase is a central uh, gene regula regulator and uh, a complex uh, biology as shown here as well. But ultimately, if you see down on the bottom, it gets to, um, to the cell cycle as well, as well as uh, stimulating anti-apoptosis and other features of cancer. So trying to target PI3 kinase has been a goal of the oncology community for the last decade or so. It's a little complicated to do it because there are multiple isoforms of PI3 kinase, and it turned out that those that are broadly active uh, were too toxic. So eventually the uh, PI3 kinase alpha uh, isoform target inhibitor, that is, um, decreases toxicity compared with a pan I3 kinase, PI3 kinase inhibitor. And these were the results of the drug called apelacib. Um, in patients who had been pretreated, and this was with fulvestrant, in patients who had been previously pretreated with endocrine therapy, metastatic HR positive HER2 negative breast cancer, showing a doubling of the progression free survival and a doubling of the response rate in patients who had a PI3 kinase mutation. So, there, that particular protein, PIK3CA, mutated cohort. In this study, it was actually looked at at all comers as well as the mutated cohort. <laughs> And it was the patients who had a mutation in uh, PIK3CA that derived benefit from alpelacib. That makes sense because this is a constitutionally active mutation, so it keeps driving, uh, driving it. And it, it is a driver oncogene. So uh, two years ago, alpelacib was uh, approved uh, based on the progression-free survival I just showed you. And it was approved as a precision targeted therapy drug. So it had a companion diagnostic that looked at the mutations in the active sites in uh, a couple different exons in uh, PI3 kinase. So the PIK3CA, these mutations that are seen here are seen in about 35 to 40 percent of breast cancer. So not a small population whatsoever. Also importantly, this approval, I think to my knowledge, the first in, in at least in breast cancer, uh, that allowed uh, genomic DNA testing from either tissue or liquid biopsy. So you can actually look in the blood here to find this mutation if you have a patient that's progressing. And if they have a PIK3CA uh, mutation, one of these 11, they're eligible for a pellicid. So that brings us to the new technologies, which are uh, looking at the blood. So we were, it used to be uh, uh, confined only to look at our tissue, and um, NGS testing has revolutionized the way we think about cancer, but we, what's revolutionizing it now is the fact that we can repetitively sample because DNA is shed from cancer cells uh, as they undergo apoptosis or, or uh, uh, other processes, and you can detect minute amounts of uh, ctDNA, uh, tumor uh, DNA in the blood, and reliably see that. Actually, the first report in breast cancer on ctDNA is almost a decade old, and that's shown from the New England Journal, which proved the point that you can monitor patients with ctDNA and you can see emergence of resistance with it. Now, we also know in breast cancer that the estrogen gene, which is called ESR1, codes for estrogen receptor alpha, the protein that I've been talking about. These mutations occur not infrequently in breast cancer, and if you have a mutation in ESR1, it confers uh, resistance to AIs because the gene is stuck in the on position. So it really doesn't matter if you have estrogen there or not, it'll, it'll keep working whether it's on or not, and that's what's shown preclinically in uh, the, the left-hand panel. And then uh, in testing retrospectively, looking at ESR1 mutations based on the drugs that were used, so uh, one particular trial that compared fulvestrin to the Sophia trial, it turned out that 
as you would expect, if you just block um, with an AI and don't have any estrogen, you really don't get much benefit. But if you have a selective estrogen receptor down regulator like fluvestrin, even in the presence of ESR1 mutations, it was more effective, which you see in the left-hand panel on the right, compared to they were really about the same if there was no mutation. So that led to uh, this trial that was just reported a couple of months ago at um, San Antonio, the PADA-1 trial, which actually used both of the things I've been talking about, CTDNA monitoring and ESR1 mutations, uh, to try to design better, more rational therapy, uh, personalized therapy for HR-positive breast cancer. You can see the design on the left. Basically, the idea was monitor these patients, and if the, if the ESR1 mutation popped up in blood samples, they would switch therapy. And when they did switch therapy to fulvestrin in this study, you see the light blue line on the right, the progression-free survival was better. So this is a, a great um, paradigm for how we're going to design trials in the future. Monitoring with ctDNA, using ctDNA to have early resistance, and potentially changing therapy uh, based on the molecular changes. So I want to just finish um, with uh, how you can bring precision oncology into your practice. All of these advances are wonderful, but like we've heard in the last two years, you know, you can make amazing vaccines, but unless you get it into the arm, it really doesn't do anything. So you can sequence all you want, you can deep sequence, you can do deepest sequencing, unless you understand what those sequences are and you can translate that into a patient, it really doesn't help you in the clinic. So um, about 10 years ago, we came up at West Clinic uh, with this vision of a state-of-the-art center of personalized and precision cancer care. And our mission was to provide every patient with the proper molecular diagnostic to offer the best uh, treatment option for every line of therapy. That was a little ahead of its time, but not that much. And uh, we realized in 2011 that molecular profiling just at the uh, infancy of NGS testing uh, was going to be good. And uh, we spent quite some time over the next few years evaluating uh, labs to work with and figuring out how to transmit that information to all of our providers. And in 2014, we also increased our research uh, capacity to do phase one clinical trials, including precision trials. We implemented a molecular tumor board, and we implemented a, a strategy for molecular profiling. So that implementation took a standardized approach to uh, molecular profiling. And basically what we said is, if you have advanced cancer now, uh, we actually started with the most common cancers, but over about a year or two, we included every advanced cancer. We should be recommending testing at that time and doing uh, broad panel sequencing. Uh, in 2014, many people were still doing PCR for individual genes but we understood that NGS testing was becoming the standard, and we capitalized on that and recommended that from that time on. Of course, today it is the standard. If you look at NCCN guidelines, for example, for lung cancer, with nine targets, multiplex testing or NGS testing is the way to do it. And not only did we recommend it, but we, we integrated it into our routine protocols. We uh, uh, developed ways to um, mine that data, and it facilitated our research. So what, what did we do with that? Well, we had a, uh, an excellent molecular tumor board uh, that runs to this day weekly, and we evaluate every single case that comes in uh, with testing for NGS. And uh, we actually published, Dr. Vanderwald, who co-chaired that committee with me and then uh, chaired it afterwards um, for five years, and, I, and, and several of us published this paper in uh, the journal Personalized our, uh, medicine, which you see on the right, what, we, what did we do with these recommendations? They made clinical impact. They changed the way we treated patients. They changed the way we referred them to clinical trials. We often picked up potential germline alterations through doing the somatic mutations. And it's been extremely effective for our patients. And I'm very proud of the fact that West continues to be a leader uh, in doing uh, precision medicine. So uh, in 2020, we, as part of the One Oncology uh, Clinical Network, we expanded that, and we started doing it for practices across the country. 
And that continues with the One Oncology Process Weekly Molecular Tumor Board. Uh, between 20 and 21, we, did, we curated almost 2,100 cases across the network, and you can see Wes was the leader there uh, during that period. So I think that, um, that precision medicine has come of age. Um, I think it will continue to be the way we, we think about cancer in the future. I think we have to get smarter about using combination therapies. And in my opinion, the problem is that each of these drugs have unique toxicities. They're not so easy to combine. But of course, the other major stream, which you've heard about in the last two days, is the huge advances in immunotherapy. So I think we'll be seeing a dovetailing of uh, these two approaches going forward. And that's all uh, really great news for our patients. So uh, in conclusion, manipulating the endocrine access to affect the driver of most breast cancers was begun long before the mechanism of action was understood. And that heralded the uh, era of precision oncology. As we understand ER better, we understand we have to do multiple inhibitions at once. And when you have this increased molecular complexity, a structured system of com comprehensive and repetitive genomic testing, evaluation and education is critical for all patients to benefit maximally from precision medicine. So thank you very much for your attention, and thanks again for the kind words. One of the things that we did at West was to make a decision about when to do molecular profiling. Um, we decided that we were going to do it up front. It was controversial then, right. and it still is in some um, aspect. Um, can you talk a little bit about where you use it, and, and why do you think it's important to use it up front? Yeah, so I, you know, I, I wouldn't argue the fact that we were ahead of the game when we rec recommended it a few years ago up front. Um, I think uh, I, would, I would still defend that decision because I think we got valuable information, particularly for clinical trials, and then some of the other information that we got, uh, that we learned. And I think having the experience actually helped us for when it did become standard. So there are certain cancers where clearly up front now have become standard. and. Um, you could still argue in breast cancer that you don't need to do it in the first line. The reason I think it's important to do it in the first line, well, first of all, we anticipated the ESS, as, as you well know, our, our research in ESR1 mutations suggested that you could make a decision in the first line in certain cases if you knew that data. And uh, I, I was always struck by um, some of the work in particular, I have to credit uh, our, our colleague and partner, uh, Dr. Grothy, who, 15 years ago came up with this concept of let's think about all lines of therapy for colon cancer. Let's not just think about what are we going to do first and then go, uh-oh, it's a, it's a fire drill. What are we going to do second? Let's plan out our lines of therapy. And I really think all cancers should be approached that way. Um, you heard uh, in hematologic malignancies how we're now planning multiple for those that are, and stratifying patients by high and, and low risk. So I think having it up front now is a standard. One slide I left out because of time was new ASCO recommendations that came out about two weeks ago, um, which you can see in this, this uh, current issue of JCO, recommending uh, not a little bit uh, blurry on what the time is, but essentially recommending for all advanced cancers molecular profiling. So I think we're in perfect shape right now. <laughs> 